How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the More We Know podcast. My name is Mir, your host. The More We Know podcast is the world's mentorship platform. The More We Know was launched as a literal mentor in your pocket. So whether you're a Gen Z, millennial, wherever you are, you're able to get access to high quality mentors literally in your pocket from wherever you are, whether you're on the way to work, whether you're at work, whether you're in school, wherever you're at, we promise to provide you a mentor in your pocket. We've brought on people like the mayor of Miami, the founder of Reebok. We just did the former CEO of Chipotle, which was an awesome episode. And today I am super, super excited for our mentor. We're going to switch it up and go into the real estate space. We have John Grauman. John is one of the regulars on the top 10 Netflix series, Buying Beverly Hills, and he is making a splash and he's a series regular. It's a, it's a show that I just recently started watching. If you've on Netflix, if you like real estate, you've definitely seen this show and being where his role is. It's, it's quite amazing to watch what he's done, but most notably John's done so many different things. He's developed a modern architectural home designed by the acclaimed architect Heggy Baselberg that sold for $24 million. He's made a single sale for $75 million, which was the 10th highest sale in the history of Los Angeles. And he's ranked among the top realtors in the country and recognized by the Wall Street Journal, by the LA Business Journal, LA Magazine. And just, you know, even in 2019, he sold over $230 million in real estate, which just continues to put him in the top ranking. So from real estate sales to being on a Netflix TV show, to being an LA native, to seeing all sides of the business and being in the business now, by the way, for more than 17 years. So he's seen things like 2008. We're, we're, we're in for a treat today. John, thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Wow, what an introduction. I feel like I have some big shoes to fill here with the <laughs> guests that you've had in the past, but um, I love this platform and I think it's such a great, um, I think it's such a great thing that you set up to provide mentorship, as you said, in people's pocket from people that have sort of, you know, walked it from all different uh, walks of life and have a story to tell. Thanks, John. It's, uh, it's going to be an exciting one. So, you know, you are in the real estate field. I've sort of mentioned what you've done and how you've accomplished it, but I always like to take our guests back a little bit. So <laughs> rewind back for me, your childhood growing up, what your parents might have done. Like, let, let's hear about your childhood first. Sure. Yeah. So I'm an LA native. Uh, in fact, I'm fifth generation from LA, which is pretty rare in and of itself. You can talk about a city of transplants that so many people move from, excuse me, move to from other places around the world. Um, to be a fifth generation, uh, Angelino is pretty special. My family was steeped in old Hollywood history. Um, I was actually just tracing this back with my family recently. At one point in time, I had a great grandfather who was the head of RKO Pictures. I had another great grandfather that was the business manager for Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. And then my cousin, Sid Grauman, built Grauman's Chinese Theater, which is obviously an iconic theater. Um, so anyways, grew up in Manhattan Beach. Um, and, you know, what a blessed place to be able to call home as a kid. And Manhattan Beach, for those of you that don't know it, is this little beach community here, um, kind of on the outskirts of LA. It was not the Beverly Hills, excuse me, it was not the uh, Beverly Hills of the South Bay as it is now. It was a really just kind of quaint little beach town, um, but a great place to call home. And I started there. Um, School, I found, was not the right place for me. I just didn't thrive in that environment. Um, in fact, I was always kind of itching to just get out and sort of get started with whatever was next. Constantly find myself asking that question even today. What's next? What's next? Um, so I actually didn't graduate high school. Um, I got my GED. Um, and believe it or not, my story, at least as a young adult, really starts in the rave scene. That's where that's where I started. That's where I got my chops. I... I you know, because high school wasn't really the right fit for me, I just didn't really find my my community there. Um, the rave scene, and I'm going back now to the mid '90s when it was still very much like underground warehouses, like illegal parties, at underground warehouses, um, was where I really found a sense of community and where I really started to thrive. And then was just curious about the business side of that, so I started throwing raves. I became a rave promoter, um, and. Do you want me to, I, sorry, I know you wanted me to talk about my childhood. I'm just sort of going through the kind of course of my career, if that's okay. No, no, I, I, I love that. I think even mentioning where you're at with the, the rave scene is important because you hear all these successful individuals like Dave Grutman of Miami, similar sort of path from bartending. It just, it goes back to the narrative of, you know, career paths not being linear, but directionally they can go from all over the place and you never know where you end. But please walk us, walk us through the story. But now, by the way, were your parents okay with that? You going down this path? Were my parents okay with that? My parents, I give so much credit for the person that I am today. I'm essentially split just 50-50 of who my mom is and who my dad is. And I can obviously elaborate on that more. But 
Um, I feel like they gave me just enough rope that I could have hung myself with it, but allowed <laughs> me to just be out there and try to learn from my own mistakes and recognize that, hey, this wasn't the right fit for you. We're not really thrilled about this teenage kid of ours going out till, you know, the wee morning hours coming home at sunrise, you know, experimenting with drugs and doing all those things. But they just allowed me the opportunity to, I guess, kind of find my path, which is a really amazing thing, especially speaking now as a parent, as a father of two. Frankly, I have no idea how they did it. I, I must have caused them a lot of sleepless nights, which in fairness, I've apologized for profusely and <laughs> continue to try to make amends for. Um, but in any event, uh, yeah, so the first party that I threw was at an abandoned bowling alley in downtown LA. I think the posted capacity was somewhere around 900 people. We had close to 2,000. Uh, fire marshal got called, shut down the whole party. Everybody got forced out on the streets around 1.30 in the morning. Um, and literally, like, they had two city blocks that were sectioned off. There was helicopters above, cops in riot gear, ambulances, fire trucks, the whole nine. My dad's looking at me going, what have you done? What did you do? <laughs> and fun little, little fun fact, when that happens, when like the cops come out in the riot gear and whatnot, there's a bill for it. Somebody has to pay for that. And they tried actually, you know, forcing me to pay it, but I was a minor. I was 17 years old. So that wow. was, you know, that was my sort of, that was my education. That was my schoolyard. Um, yeah. So I started throwing bigger and bigger parties. Um, with a very dear friend of mine still to this day, a guy named Pasquale Rotella that owns Insomniac that does EDC, which is the biggest festival on planet Earth. Yeah. And we had done an event that attracted the attention of a record label. The record label came calling with a job offer, um, which I took. I was, think I was 19 or 20 at the time um, to be the uh, a and director. And a and for those of you who don't know, stands for Artist and Repertoire. So you're the person that is tasked with finding the talent, signing the talent, and then being the liaison between the label and the talent. Um, it's a really fun job. Uh, and then flash forward to like 2002. And for those of you that weren't alive in 2002 or have a vague recollection of 2002, I'll just remind you that this was the dawn of Napster, which then came with music pirating, CD burning, file sharing. The, mu the record industry imploded seemingly overnight. You had major companies, Sony and Columbia and Universal, laying off people by the thousands. Um, and unfortunately, I got sort of swept up in that. So I went out, uh, anyways, had parted ways with the record label. And an artist I had just signed uh, was Mixmaster Mike from the Beastie Boys. Oh, wow. And Mike got asked in the most unlikely of pairings to go out on tour with Guns N' Roses, which at the time made no sense to me. Like, why is Mixmaster Mike, a DJ, going to be the opening act for Guns N' Roses? And all you have to do is spend a couple nights out on tour with guns to realize that Axel is usually at minimum an hour, sometimes two hours late. And you can't exactly <laughs> ask the opening band to just play their set all over again. You can ask a DJ to play another record, play another record, play another record. So found myself out on tour with guns, crazy wild experience in my early 20s. From there, I went on tour with Ozzy. I got hooked up on tour with Manson and just kind of saw the writing on the walls and said, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. I don't want to be living on a tour bus 10 months out of the year. Um, it just wasn't right for me. So I jumped ship and being from LA, as I mentioned, I've always just kind of thought if you're going to live in LA, there's two industries you really want to work in entertainment or real estate, it's the two mm -hmm. driving forces that make LA what it is. Mm -hmm. So I went to go get started in real estate. A uh, family friend recommended that I go intern at a mortgage company just to kind of get that baseline of knowledge, which I did and picked it up quickly. And before I knew it, I'm doing loans, which I'd never had any intention of doing. I sat down at that desk that day. The last job I had 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 prior to that moment was on tour with Ozzy Osbourne. And there I am sitting in front of a computer looking at a mortgage rate chart. I thought my life was over. I literally thought I had died. It was just like, I can't, I'm 23 years old. My life is over. I'm just going to be sitting at a desk job for the rest of my life. And John, that I need to just hammer on that point there because- Please. You know, when uh, when COVID happened for us Gen Zs, that was our first effective professional crisis. It sounds like for you, your first professional crisis was, you know, Napster tech. There was th that whole age of 2000 to 2002. We saw the tech bubble and the burst, and layoffs were across yeah. the scale. And you ended up being in a situation from, you know, you were the man. You were doing rave and parties and dealing with all these A-list celebrities to then being humbled and doing mortgage. What? What did you have to do to maintain a positive mindset in that situation? Because so many of us feel lost right now. Yeah, that's a really great question and a fair point. And talk about being humbled. I mean, there was a moment there where like, you know, I remember going to the grocery store. I'm a young kid. I'm, you know, living in an apartment in Hollywood and going to the grocery store and be like, do I spend 25 cents on this pack of gum or do I save wow. the money? Like, you know, wow. I just didn't have anything. Wow. Um, 
And, you know, actually I'll digress here for a quick second, because I think this is a valuable learning lesson. In fact, it was one of the most valuable lessons I've ever learned in my life. And it's something I carry with me today. So I was very close with the owner of this record label that I worked at. It was an independent label. We weren't talking about some big conglomerate. And parting ways was difficult, I think, for everyone because there was a closeness there. But again, the industry had just imploded. And they came to me with a severance package. And being young and naive and probably a little cocky, um, I rejected the amount that they had offered me because it was, you know, it was a fraction of what I was owed. I had a contract. The contract stated I was owed X. They offered Y. I went to a couple attorneys and said, yeah, screw them. No, we'll fight it. Great. Okay, let's do that. And I rejected it. And I tried to fight them and hired an attorney who sent a couple of letters and then said, yeah, you know what? There's no money in this for me. I, I'm sorry. Good luck, kid. Wow. And instead of getting, I won't name the dollar amount, but you know, a sub, a substan what would have been a substantial amount of money to me at that time, I walked away with nothing. Wow. And the lesson that I learned from that is understanding the difference between what's right and what's relevant. I was right. Mm. And so often in life, we feel like we are right. And we get so justified in that position, that principle of being right. I could be right all day long. It just wasn't relevant. What was relevant is that they had deeper pockets than I did, mm. period. They could withstand the fight longer than I could. They could weather the storm longer than I could. That's all that mattered. Being right will only get you so far. But you have to understand the difference between what's right and what's relevant. And I, again, I carry that with me every day. That, uh, that, is, that is powerful to have that right versus relevancy. And, and you know, some of it is we have to put our ego aside, right, and, and, and have that perspective. 100%. It, it's absolutely a, a battle between you and your own ego. Hmm. It really is. And I deal with that in real estate every day because in real estate, you deal with people that the seemingly most logical, sensible, reasonable, rational people lose their minds when it comes <laughs> to buying and selling homes. I mean, lose their minds. So, you know, that's my part of my job is to offer perspective. That's what I can do. My, I have the gift I give is the gift of objectivity because they lose sight of that when they're in the deal. It's their home. It's their baby. I can be objective and thus provide that perspective, which oftentimes talks people down off the ledge. Um, so yeah, it was a humbling experience, but I wasn't really, I didn't really have any other options. It was, you know, okay, well I, I do this until I find something else. Um, I didn't really, you know, envision myself being a mortgage broker for the rest of my life, but I also caught the market at what was the hottest time in the history of mortgages. So, you know, I was able to catch it on an updraft and before I know it, I'm in my early twenties and I'm making more money than I had ever made up to that point. And thinking, you were 23 at this point, John, when you were nah, uh, making... 23, 24, 25, you know, I'm kind okay. of working my way through like 2003, four, five, 2006. Here comes 2007. Here comes 2008. And, you know, I here I come from the record industry thinking that I just jumped off one sinking ship onto a lifeboat. That <laughs> lifeboat then steams right into the mortgage crisis, like it, you know, like the Titanic hitting an iceberg. Yeah. And... That was a scary time. That was far scarier than what I faced when the record industry took its, you know, took its downfall. You know, being a mortgage broker in the middle of the mortgage crisis was essentially like having a front row seat for the end of the world. It was terrifying. Yeah. Um, and you know, looking back on it now, I, people didn't even know what was happening. There's there's two great movies. If you haven't seen them, please, please watch them. One is called The Big Short, yep. which was critically acclaimed with a bunch of big celebrity actors. And the other is called Too Big to Fail. And that was an HBO yep. movie. And that might even be the better of the two. I've probably watched both of them. I'm not exaggerating 30 times because mm -hmm. utterly fat. I lived it. Yeah. So to watch now the perspectives, it's sort of the 30,000 foot elevation, the bird's eye perspective on what actually happened, how close we came to the brink of total financial collapse. I'm talking about no money in the ATM machines, no milk on the shelf at the grocery store, like total anarchy is, I literally just got the chills. It's, it was, you know, so that's why I flash forward to this moment where we are today in a market that's obviously going through, a, you know, a long overdue correction, a recession, um, really doesn't look all that daunting. It's not that scary when you've lived through 2008 mm. and that's what perspective gives you. Um, so that was a dark time and that, that wasn't a few months. That was a few years. That was 2008 to 2011. That was a really dark time. Um, put that in perspective. Uh, when I met my now wife, um, both of our bank accounts were being levied by the IRS. 
Wow. Um, what, what, what do you mean by that levied by the IRS? So when you owe the IRS money uh, and they come knocking on your door, sometimes literally looking <laughs> for that money uh, and you put them off and you blow them off and you do whatever you do at a certain point, they will just uh, find your bank accounts and start taking money out of it. Wow. Yeah. So all of a sudden you look in your bank account, which was pretty depressing to begin with, right? It was a pretty, um, you know, minimal amount of money and dismal amount of money. And then there's no money because they took mm. it. So my bank account, both of our bank accounts were being levied by the IRS. My house was in pre-foreclosure. Oh my which gosh. To elaborate on that means when you don't pay your mortgage, they give yep. you warning and warning and warning. And then they say, okay, we're going to come possess your home. And how old are you at this point? I bought my first house when I was 27. Um, and this has probably got to be, God, I'm just trying to think early thirties, early thirties. And you were married at the time? No, no. Just dating okay. my now wife. Um, well, I, I need to, I need to understand that concept too. Cause you, you meet your, you meet your now wife, you guys are dating. Obviously you've had a very successful marriage, but at the time when you don't have money and you don't have, you know, direction or clarity, was it, was it hard being in a relationship? Was it easy? Like how important is it? Was it having a partner that was aligned with you on that? That's a great question. Um, so at that point, I had reached the end of my mortgage career. Um, when I met her, I was a mortgage broker. In fact, that's how we met. Oh, wow. Uh, she's always been in real estate. She was essentially managing a small um, real estate company here in Beverly Hills. She was the one sitting at the front desk as kind of like the office manager. And I used to come in and speak about mortgages to the agents. I was essentially the in-house lender. Uh, so that's how we met. And... I had just sort of reached that moment, that I, moment that I know so many of us have and so many of you will, which is that moment of that's it, not another minute, not another moment, not another second, I'm done. It's just a breaking point where you say, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to settle for this life. I'm not willing to settle for these circumstances. I'm not willing to settle for this, which I've created. I want to make, I want to make a change. And, I, and so I did. So I finally eight years later made the change that I had initially intended to the eight years prior, which is to become a real estate agent. I, you know, I spent my whole day sitting at a desk fighting and bickering with underwriters over what I felt was common sense. That's enough to drive someone mad. The number of times I uttered the phrase, I'm going to burn the building down if you guys don't just yeah. come to your senses. So I, I, I just decided it was time. So I was shifting into a new career with no established business to speak of whilst my account's being levied by the IRS, whilst my home is in pre-foreclosure. And yes, trying to date and charm this lovely young woman. <laughs> um, there's actually, there's a really sort of famous, not famous, there's a special story that her and I always sort of reflect on, which is she was a mobile notary at the time, which is to say that, you know, she would be the one that helped you sign some documents, just to try to pick up some extra cash on the side. Yeah. And she had helped me sign some loan docs for a client. And I wanted to get her a little thank you gift. So I went to this store called Lush, which is a, uh, like a, a bath and body kind of store. Like they have, you know, bath salts and balms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I got there and I'm looking and I'm looking and I got to the register and realized I don't have any money. Oh my gosh. Like I don't have any money. And there were some sample packs sitting on the counter. And I, I remember going to her office with a card and this, this free sample pack. And I gave it to her and said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm, I, thank you. And I'm sorry. I, I don't, I can't do anything more than this right now. This is all I have. Um, but you know, flash forward 13, 12 years later, I guess. Yeah. Um, almost 13. Yeah. 12 years. Excuse me. Um, here we are, and we we've built sort of a, a little empire together, which we're really proud of. So, that's uh, that's I, I gotta give you your flowers for that because that's so powerful and important. I think now in this generation, uh, a lot of us Gen Zs, you know, we glamorize, we see a lot of relationships on social media, and I know we want to get into you know switching from mortgages to real estate. When I, when I saw everything going on with Ninja Loans, by the way, I'm I'm really curious to see kind of <laughs> where where it went with you. But I think it's. You know, we, we glamorize these relationships we see on social media. Unfortunately, as you know, John, social media shows us the makeup of what's going on, you know, in front of the positives, but we don't effectively see the true, you know, battles and toughness that comes behind it. And so for you to go through that and, and have a moment like that where you, you did even sample packets to now, I mean, you, you look you look up the empire that you guys have built over in real estate. It is I think that's what makes it way cooler, right? Like, that's amazing. You have one of the best record sellings in Los Angeles real estate history, but you know, to have a marriage that's lasted through trials and tribulations and to also, you know, 10x build way more than you guys started with, it's, that's what's really motivating that. I hope the audience can take away from that, that, that it is possible. 
I hope so too. And, and honestly, my wife and I, that story kind of defines us that we built this together and it's so much more enriching. It's so much more meaningful, um, to have built it together. You know, not either one of us came into something where like, oh, well, this is already established. Like yeah. we literally did this from the ground up. Yeah. Um, and that's extremely meaningful to us. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's just beyond powerful. So then, you know, you, you were in mortgages, she's in real estate. You felt like your mortgage career was basically over at that point. Yep. What made you want to get into real estate? I had always, again, that was the intention back in like 03 was to become a real estate agent. And I just kind of tripped and fell into mortgages and then got stuck there like quicksand. <laughs> um, so I've always been very front facing. I'm a people kind of person. I'm, you know, I'm outgoing. I have no problem just striking up a conversation with someone. So I just thought my skill sets would be better suited in on that side of the aisle. So I switched to that side of the aisle and then I starved for another year. I didn't sell a house for, it took me over a year to sell my first house. Um, over a year, over a year. So there was a lot of moments. There was a lot of tears guys. I and mean, there was a lot of just like, you know, head on the kitchen counter crying, just not figuring out like, well, how is this not connecting it? How are all of my efforts not bearing fruit yet? When is this finally going to come to fruition? And it's just building blocks. And for some people that those building blocks happen much quicker and faster, and there's a compound effect to that. And for others, it's a slower burn. And for me, it was the latter. Um, so it just took me a while. But eventually, one sale led to two, which led to three. And then there's a sort of domino effect, right? You kind of get the pot to a boil to a boil and then it spills over and that's what happened for me and then it just kind of gradually continued to build you know I started getting to a place where in 2014 my wife and I decided to work together something that we had always sworn off we never wanted to be that cheesy hokey real estate couple <laughs> it's not our vibe and it then it just made too much sense I went to an event uh, I'm big guys I'm big on going to I don't want to call them self-help events because that sounds cheesy and hokey, but, uh, <laughs> you know, Tony Robbins, those I've been to every single one of his events. And, and the purpose is total immersion to put yourself in an environment where for just a brief moment, you can shut out the rest of the outside world and really focus on yourself and ask yourself the questions you just forget to ask because you're too busy trying to keep up with life. Does my life currently match what I envision for it, right? Does my life match the blueprint I have for it? Do I feel like I'm centered with what I want my purpose and identity to be? And you know, you go to the the good events will really kind of give you constructive tools on how to work through those big, challenging, daunting questions. Um, so, anyways, I went to this event, and I won't bore you with all the details, but the overarching takeaway was: this is not a one man job. It's just not. I can't be the best salesperson and the best marketer and the best operator and the this. I just can't. And my wife, fortunately, was the other side. She was the operator. And every, you know, you have two sort of, two lanes in this business, artists and operators. And fortunately, she's one of the most brilliant, talented art, art operators, excuse me, you could ever hope to find. So I, I left the event. I went back to my hotel room. I called her. I said, I want you to quit your job and come work with me. And foolishly, we were planning our wedding at the same time. And just a quick tip, don't start a new business with your spouse at the same time you're planning a wedding. It was, oh my God, Oof. we spent the first like three months just going like, what did we do and how do we undo it? Like we couldn't agree literally on which way the desk should face. It was awful. <laughs> but then we figured it out and we figured it out by, you know, understanding a clear sort of division of responsibilities. And that's been a guiding principle in our life our business, our marriage is if you have really big aspirations, if there's a lot you want to achieve, you cannot do it alone. So the only way to do it is to divide and conquer and have a clear sense of that division of responsibilities and a very strong trust in that person's ability to carry out those responsibilities. Sure. Um, so, you know, here we are sitting in a shared cubicle back to back, <laughs> bumping into each other, hitting elbows trying to build a business, trying to uh, plan a wedding. Um, and then again, it just kind of started to pick up. We started doubling our business each year. We did 50 million, we did 100 million, we did 200 million. What year was it when you guys did 50 million? 
That's a good question. Um, let's see, I did 200 million in like 2019, so 100 in 2018, so probably around 2017. Wow. So um, the, the, was the momentum like when did, cause all businesses have these breakthrough moments where you have initially what you had, you couldn't sell a house for a year, which gosh, yeah. that's, you know, the mental toughness there, but where was the, like, what year was it? The breakthrough you're like, God, we really have something here. Like we're going to crush this. I would say it was right around 2017, 18. Okay. We really started building ahead of steam. We had started to create a small team, very small, four or five people, junior agents, one admin, one staff member, um, working in support of us, but you could tell we were on the right path. Uh, my name was starting to get more established in the real estate world. I was starting to build a reputation. Um, uh, and then it started to get really exciting. Then we had, you know, the 2019 had that huge sale for 75 million, which was the 10th highest sale at the time. I just want to be clear there. I've been, it's no longer 10th. There have been plenty of higher sales in the last few years, but, at but the you got you got you got to you got to tell us about that, John, because I, I posted on my social media last week that I was prepping for this interview, and the question kept coming up. Like, I I don't mean to cut you off, but I need to hear about that right. sale. Like, it was a so 75 million dollar sale. It was a 75 million dollar sale. Well, and how did you like? Where did it go from? How did you get the prospect? To how did you get, like? That's such. I, I need to hear this story. Uh well. You know, in the world of high-end luxury real estate, uh, you deal with a lot of um, affluent people. As to say, I mean, these are titans of industry. These are people that rule the world. Yeah. And uh, I have to be respectful of their privacy and sure. their, uh, we have to sign a lot of NDAs. Yeah. So there's only so much that I can tell you about it. I can tell you that it was an international buyer. I can tell you that it was, you know, one of the most spectacularly beautiful homes in all of the world. Um, and it was also one of the most challenging deals that, I don't know how many years I'm going to live, but whatever that amount is, it would have been a few more had I not lived through this deal. Like that deal <laughs> took years off my life. Um, you know, it was meant to be, I think, a 45-day escrow turned into a six-month escrow. Wow. Um, we discovered a litany of problems during the escrow, had to do, restructure the deal to do what it's called holdbacks to be able to address some of the remediation issues, which were in these seven figures. It was... Jeez. It was a... a it was one of those deals where you have to, you have to in those moments take yourself out of the deal and remind yourself that it's not about you, right? Especially in, in this business, we're a conduit. We're here to help usher people from point A to B to C in what is oftentimes the most daunting and foreign and you know can be scary experience of their life because they're dealing with what is probably their most valuable prized possession. Um, so you just have to in that moment focus on the deal, and it's like how do you see through the fog? 10 feet at a time, right? You just go 10 feet at a time. So yeah, so we had that big sale. Um, and the next year, this is really interesting. So, you know, look, there's always opportunity in the most unlikely of places. My dad used to always tell me there's opportunity in chaos. And COVID hit in 2020. And obviously we all went into lockdown. Um, and while we're sitting there in lockdown and my wife had just given birth to our daughter. So she, we're sitting at home with a newborn, which the only silver lining there is that everyone had to cancel the travel plans during COVID. Not us. We weren't going anywhere. We were planning on being at home anyways. We had yeah. a newborn. Um, but there we are with our newborn trying to make sense of the world. And we got awarded this really big account. Um, one that I never thought we would get, but it, it was a game changer. It was, I remember speaking to my business coach and I do have a business coach and calling him and saying, you know, we just got this. And he goes, listen to me and listen to me carefully. This is the goose that lays golden eggs. You get one shot at this. Wow. Like you have to make this work. You have to capitalize on this moment, whatever that means, however much you have to invest, whatever you have to maybe, you know, dig deeper into your pockets. Like think of it as a J curve. It's not going to pay off immediately, but if you get it right, it'll be huge for you in the long run. And fortunately we followed that advice and during the lockdown, we were forced to scale our team from what was five, six people to 20 people seemingly overnight. We had about four days to do it. So wow. I am trying to recruit agents from home on the phone. Wow. And we did it in about four days. We had quickly scaled up to about 20 people, got this account and started working it. Um, then uh, I had an opportunity to partner with a, another agent that I've always just had such a tremendous amount of not only admiration, but adoration. I just adored him. He's just one of the best people on the planet. He's just one of those people that is as talented and gifted as he is kind and generous. And I just love the, I just love him. And an opportunity presented itself for us to, to partner. And that year we did 750 million. Wow. Um, and started building on that. 
And then obviously I'm kind of jumping all around here, but you know, last year the market obviously took a significant turn as we you know, made our way into this recession. But again, I've always believed that there's opportunity and chaos. When the rest of the market is reeling, I want to be surging. So I'm always looking for those opportunities because I'm not, look, I'm not the guy that has the grand vision that can see the horizon five years out. I'm the guy that's really good at recognizing opportunities when they cross my path and not being afraid to take a chance on them. I'm envious. I'm in awe of the people that can see the horizon that far out. I'm not that guy, but I do look for opportunities. And another opportunity presented itself recently um, to huge agents in our space, gigantic agents and dear friends, James Harris and David Parnes. If anyone's ever seen Million Dollar Listing, they were the Brits on yeah. Million Dollar Listing LA. Uh, an opportunity presented itself for us to merge forces and create essentially a, a superpower, if you will, um, which we did last year. And I'm proud to say last year we collectively combined, we did 1.4 billion in sales. 1.4 billion? 1.4 billion in sales. Wow. So that, yeah. that that's that's in the rece the the year that we just had. That's in the year that we just had. Yeah. Or the, I mean, we thought we were going to hit two, but <laughs> the government they're, they're, they're a little bit. Wow. That's so. It, and you know, I got so many DMs. I'm just looking through some of these now, where it was, you know, a lot of agents are struggling to even make one sale now. They, they were struggling before, but now mortgage rates, you know, with the and, and Powell just did another 25 basis points the other day. And, yep. you know, you know, you're looking at some mortgages recently uh, up some 30 years were seven, seven and a half, eight, like what, what, you know, how are you guys able to have such significant growth? Obviously you had an amazing merger, but despite that, that environment, that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, well, so we did see rates, uh, you know, in the sevens as recently as Q4 of last year, fortunately rates have come back yeah. down. We're actually seeing rates today back down in the fours, Five, which yeah. is phenomenal. In fact, even though Powell raised rates by raised the federal fund rate rather yeah. by 25 basis points the other excuse me by 25 basis points yesterday mortgage interest rates interestingly didn't budge in fact in many instances they went down and the reason for that is that as we started to go into this recession banks started baking in the worst case pricing because mm -hmm. a lot of people thought it's Armageddon all over again you know the market's going to fall off a cliff the market's going to crash so they started baking that into their pricing and then we came back out of after the holidays to realize the market's not going to fall, or rather the market hasn't fallen off a cliff and it's probably not going to. And with that came sort of a renewed sense of confidence and banks started to slowly drop their interest rates. And even though, again, the Fed just raised the federal fund rate yesterday, they also signaled that we're probably nearing the end of the Fed rate hikes. Um, and that is going to provide the one thing that all markets truly thrive on, which is stability. Um, markets thrive on stability and certainty, and it's been a very uncertain time. When things are uncertain, the natural human tendency is to just pump the brakes. It's to pause and pull back. So trying to get back to answering your question in terms of, you know, how do we survive and thrive during that time? It, it, look, it was really challenging. I mean, guys, I know this sounds like sort of monopoly money, and, and it is. I, I, I Don't get me wrong. I realize how blessed I am to get to sell real estate in one of the richest, most affluent markets in the world. But there was a point in Q3 of last year we had 165 million fall out of escrow in a span of about four weeks. Wow. And that's like, that's like getting kicked in the nuts and then run over by a cement truck. <laughs> it's fucking brutal. Yeah. It's just, it was, that's hard to come back from <sighs> mentally. That's hard to get yourself out of the bed in the morning. That's hard to find the motivation to just get up in the day and like put on the, the, the battle armor and go, you know, and go fight the good fight every day. It was really, really tough. Um, but fortunately, again, sorry, trying to get back to answering the question at hand. That's great. People need houses. It's it's not a want, it's a need. And you know, what one of the positive things that we have going for us right now in the real estate world is that the millennial generation is bigger and putting a greater strain on the housing market than any that we've ever seen before, greater than that of the boot of the baby boomers, excuse me. Um, and they're coming into their own. They're coming into the early 30s where they are getting established in their career, getting married, having kids, and need houses. So that demand isn't going to go away. And the reality is in 2008, when the mortgage crisis hit, building kind of shrunk. And we fell behind the pace that is necessary to keep up with the growing population each year. And we've been behind pace for 14, now 15 consecutive years. So there is a massive, there's just an ongoing imbalance between the supply and demand chain. And real estate is at the mercy of supply and demand economics sure. like any other industry. And that imbalance is what, I mean, that and obviously a, you know, incredibly 
uh, low interest rate environment over the last few years is what really kind of fueled and drove the market. And that fortunately right now is what's helping to stabilize the market. Yes, as a result of higher interest rates, there are fewer buyers in the market, but there's even fewer amounts of inventory, right? Because if you think about it, what's happening right now kind of doesn't make sense to a lot of people. There, there's meant to be a teeter-totter effect. As interest rates go up, people's purchasing power goes down and thus so should home prices. So why haven't they? Well, there's only one reason. It's because so many people refinance in the last few years and it is historically low interest rates that they don't want to give up. So they're holding on to them for dear life. They're, they're just, there's a, a stranglehold on the inventory and that imbalance, think about it this way, real estate's a commodity like anything else. What happens when there's less of, a, of any commodity? Its value goes up or in this case, it stabilizes. So that's what's happening. And right now you have, there's two kinds of agents right now, the confident agent and the confused agent. Most of the latter, they just don't understand what connects the dots. They don't understand how the dots connect rather and what makes it all tick. One of the things that's been you know, part of my success is I, I get the big picture. I'm not an economist. Again, I didn't graduate high school, guys. I, I, I'm the furthest thing in the world from being an educated person in you know, the scholastic sense. But understanding what moves the market and how the pieces connect is huge. That's, 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 that's powerful to not only reaffirm to us because so many of us now, you know, it's, it's, oh, if we don't have the right degree or, you know, some, sometimes our, our parents have eclipsed on us this idea that you have to go to school, you have to do this. So number one, you know, you didn't even graduate high school and you, you know, just, I'm thinking about the 1.4 billion of sales. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable, but this idea of confidence and understanding the market, there's, I like what you said about there's opportunity in every crisis. And I think that's, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of people got spoiled, if you will, in the last few years with, you know, rates were below almost zero. The money was free. You looked at all these growth companies at scale, just getting free money growing tremendously tenfold. We, we saw a lot of companies that might, maybe it shouldn't have been trillion dollar companies. I remember even Zillow, Zillow got to two, three hundred billion dollars in market cap, and so you know it was it was free money environment. Now this year we see all these layoffs going on, and Google, like even the, the biggest tech in the world, is laying off at scale. And I still like the fact that you've you've kept that perspective. So do you feel that you know if you're an agent in today's economy, is the what's the, what's the number one skill or attribute they need to be able to sell a lot of houses or you know try to emulate your success? You know, I think that the Look, the amount of income that you make will always be directly proportionate to the amount of value you provide. So to me, it's about trying to find new and creative ways to provide value, to be of service. Um, I think that that's key. I think that you know, experience matters. If you don't have it, find a way to gain it as quickly as possible by joining a team, by finding a mentor, right? Stand on the shoulders of giants until you can become one yourself. Um, there's too many people that try to go this alone and... Mm -hmm. You know, look, look, there's far too low of a bar for entry into the real estate community, um, to the real estate career. Uh, I don't want to get too hung up on this, but it's worth touching on quickly. You know, you take one online test and poof, you're supposed to be qualified to be a fiduciary. And, you know, again, in the city that I work in, where we're fortunate enough to have such high price points, imagine you're selling a $20 million house, right? That's a $20 million asset. If you were a wealth advisor, a financial manager, and you had a $20 million portfolio you're managing, the amount of rigorous training and testing and qualif qualifying you need to do to be able to get to that point is astronomically different than what it is to just have one listing, but it's still $20 million versus $20 million. I don't care if it's spread across stocks and bonds or in one piece of real estate. So it's a job we take really seriously. And it's a job that, you know, again, I think so many people jump into and the test doesn't prepare you for how to do the job. It's like a driving test, right? If you ever, for any of those that have a driver's license, you, you go take a driving test. That doesn't teach you how to drive a car. You got to get behind the wheel to learn how to drive a car. Same thing, right? So don't try to get behind the wheel by yourself. Go again, join a team, find a mentor, find somebody who can help you, who you can you know, learn from and glean from you know, all the, the pearls of wisdom and advice that they can give you. It's going to exponentially increase the sort of trajectory of your career. It's going to expedite that whole process. Um, uh, and then, you know, again, for, especially for people, you know, in the sort of generation that I think we're speaking to today, embrace technology, embrace all the ways, you know, technology is coming for our industry. Like it's come from every other, like it came for the record industry, as I mentioned earlier. And there only is only one choice, which is to embrace it. Resisting it is futile. Um, so embrace what that means. Embrace, you know, finding new ways to connect with people. People don't open up the, the newspaper anymore to find real estate. They go on Zillow. They go on Redfin. They go on Instagram. They go on TikTok. Yeah. 
right? Find new ways to connect with people because, you know, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. People want to work with those who they know, like, and trust, right? We've all heard that. That's somewhat self-evident. Every one of you has a sphere in your world of people that know you and like you, right? You can open up your phone and scroll through your contacts. That's your sphere. These people know you and like you, presumably. The hard part is getting them to trust you, right? Mm -hmm. That's the hard part of the equation. Yeah. And when you're asking them to trust you with their most valuable prized possession in their world, it takes on a whole different level. It takes on a whole new meaning. Yeah. So bringing in someone that, can, that provides that experience, because experience equates to trust. It just inherently does. If you have experience, there's an, an inherent sense of trust that person has in it. Find somebody that has that experience and lean on them. And I would argue that, look, we're all, obviously we all have bills to pay, but when you're in the early stages of your career, I would argue the commission doesn't even matter, right? Take 50 cents of nothing versus 100% of, excuse me, 50% of something versus 100% of nothing, mm -hmm. but just get the experience under your belt. So I don't know. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's, but... that, that's, that's a phenomenal answer. I think you, you just hit on the nose on every single part of that. So you've had, you know, you've had an illustrious real estate career and just listening to you here for the last 35, 40 minutes, I could tell that even 1.4 billion is just a start for you guys. Like, I think there's a lot more to go and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Thanks. really excited to see what's next for you guys. But you know, one, one thing that's really interesting is you are part, uh, you're a season regular on the, uh, the famous Netflix TV show, buying Beverly Hills. I, I want to talk about that. How did you get involved in that? W what are you currently doing with them and, and talk about the show? Sure. Yeah. So that was, I mean, talk about an opportunity that I never saw. I mean, I never thought I'd be, you know, on television or a real estate reality show or anything like that. But um, so the company, the brokerage that I work at is called The Agency. And the founder of the company is a gentleman named Mauricio Umansky, a huge real estate mogul in his own right. And uh, Mauricio had been, um, had been working on this concept of a reality show for a while. Um, his wife, Kyle Richards, is one of the longest standing cast members on um, The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So he's seen firsthand the impact that it can have, the audience you can reach, and then what you can do with that, how to capitalize on it. So he had, for a while, kind of been playing around this idea, but you know, it's not exactly easy. You can't just like roll out of bed and decide I'm going to film a reality show or make a reality show. So, you know, you also have to pair yourself with the right network and the right production company that hopefully understands your vision and is going to portray you in a favorable and accurate light. You know, there's enough real estate reality shows and any other type of reality show out there that's just catty and bitchy and backbiting. And we didn't want to be that. That's not who we are. We really are. The most amazing thing about this company and our group, Bond Collective, is the culture that we've created and the incredibly supportive environment that we hold each other accountable. We boost each other up. We don't want to ever be portrayed as those, you know, backstabbing people that give our, our industry a bad name. So anyways, so uh, the agency struck a deal um, with Netflix to make this show and casted anyone that was interested. Um, I really didn't think that I was going to be the right fit because the reality is, I mean, I'm, I'm rather polished. That's something that I pride myself on and something that I, you know, look at as part of my, how I identify myself. And I, I think that, the, you know, the casting director probably looked at me and was like, you're not going to say anything outlandish. You're not going to throw anyone in the pool or slap anyone in the face. And it's like, no, no, I'm not. No, I'm definitely not, not going to do that. Um, but what I, what I was able to do was I was able to provide the house porn. I was able to provide, you know, the backdrops of like the really big listings, which they needed. And then there was this really interesting idea that came about, which is the, the, the show, for those of you who've seen it, kind of has two different focuses. One is the family dynamic that exists between Mauricio and his daughters and then and how they work together and so forth. And the other is what does real estate look like? High end luxury real estate look like to the eyes of a true new agent, a rookie agent that's never done a deal before. How do they make it in this highly competitive, contentious, cutthroat industry? Well, every mentee needs a mentor. So then they came up with this second idea of like, let's create this mentee mentor relationship and portray that and give people some insights into what that looks like. So I got brought in as the mentor, which is a great role for me. It's a role that I, I, I enjoy playing and a role that I obviously play in real life. Um, so that's how I got involved with the show. And, and fortunately I am really happy with the way I was portrayed. I was, I, my greatest fear was being taken out of context, right. Mm -hmm. To be, to say something that having nothing to do with the scene that's port that is being played and then kind of splice in, but it was, it was really played very authentically. Yeah. That's awesome. And being involved. So when you said they were casting, did you have to like almost audition for it or any one part of the group could be on the show? No, not any one group. You did have to audition. I mean, kind you're not of. sitting there like reading lines, yeah. but they'd ask you to just, well, I, I guess in the industry, it's going on tape. 
right? They ask you to go on tape and much kind of like what we're doing right now, we would do a, you know, like a Zoom call with some executives over at the network and they'd ask you some questions. And I think they just want to see how you talk, how you present, whether you look and feel natural on camera and all of those things. So fortunately, I've always had a gift for gab. Um, and yeah, I, you know, look, my feeling was in terms of like celebrity fame, stardom, I've never had dreams of being recognized into every room I walk into. But I have had dreams of being respected in the right rooms. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I want to, if in the right rooms, I want to walk in and people go, oh, shit. Do you see that just walked in? Right? Like, I don't need paparazzi and that kind of stuff. And I'm never going to, again, I'm, I'm talking like, you yeah. know, that it would never happen, which is not yeah. the, the case. But then my point is that that's not something I ever sought out in life. What I sought out is respect for my peers. Yeah, that's, that, that's extremely powerful. And look, I think now we all are looking for th this idea of clout has become so popular in my generation. You know, how many followers, how do you know this person, the blue check marks, ev everything has become that. And, you know, it, it looks like for you, you've been chasing sort of the the purpose, the passion, helping elevate others through the career ladder as well. Because you, you even when I asked you, what's the number one successful trait of, you know, a, a great agent, as opposed to a traditional answer you might hear of, oh, you need to learn how to sell more or do this. For you, it goes back to being a team player and, and building a culture and learning from the right mentor, much like you're doing today being our mentor. So, you know, I, I really appreciate that about you. Now, in, in terms of you know, buying Beverly Hills and being on Netflix, what's your future plans for reality TV? Is it something you want to continue pursuing? Do you want to focus more on the business side or is there a, is there a median balance? Like, where do you want to go from here with it? That's a great question as well. Um, I, you know, there has been no formal announcement of whether there's going to be a season two, at least not yet. If there is one and I'm offered to participate in it, I would love to because I've really gotten to, um, I enjoy the platform in the respect that, because of the role that I play in the show, which again is very much the role I play in real life as a, a mentor to so many young new agents, um, the messages I've gotten, the DMs that I get mm -hmm. from people that like reach out from all over the world saying, hey man, you know, I saw you on the show and I thought it was really inspiring or hey, you know, I'm just got my license. Do you have any you know, advice for me? I find really gratifying and really fulfilling. Um, so, you know, look, this job is demanding. You can work 24 hours a day if you allow yourself to. You really have to set boundaries to create balance, which kids can certainly help you do in a real way because they ground you. Um, but uh, the point that I'm trying to make is signing up to do a show like that can be very time intensive. Um, so I have to be very mindful of how I manage my time. But I feel like, you know, to continue to have that platform, it would be somewhat wasteful for me not to um, see what more there is. Yeah. Um, you know, I always talk about how, uh, there's an analogy that I came up with, which is, um, you know, in golf, there's different tee boxes, right? You have the pros tees, you have the men's tees, you have the women's tee. Um, you know, to live and work in a city like Beverly Hills, like Los Angeles, one of the most affluent cities in the world, like I said earlier, we're teeing off from just off the green. We, we have such a massive competitive advantage to so many of the people all over the world, it would be irresponsible not to be successful. It would be mm -hmm. wasteful not to make something of this and be successful. Um, so I take that really seriously and I, I kind of, you know, that's just what gets me up every morning. Yeah, that's, that, that's amazing to have that. What, what continues beyond that? What continues to drive you, right? Like you have, you know, from our perspective, looking outside in, You've had such an illustrious career now in real estate. You've reached, you know, reality TV show being with Netflix. You've done some amazing things. Now, what what drives you to that next level? Like, what what more fuels you? Where do you want to go next? You know, again, this goes back to what I said earlier in terms of not really being able to see the horizon as sure. well as like my wife can. If she was on the call, she would have like, <laughs> oh my god, she would have like a ten page bullet point summary yeah. of exactly where we're going, yeah. what we're going to do, and what year we're going to hit it. And that's yeah. just not me. For yeah. me, you know, my pillars in life are accomplishment and achievement. I don't really assign much more to that. Mm -hmm. I just want to feel like I'm making a difference. I want to feel like I'm making an impact. I want to feel a sense of accomplishment. I want to feel a sense of growth. Um, you know, for, the notion of fulfillment has always been something that really kind of perplexed me. It's just like, it's the ultimate goal in life. It's the ultimate goal is attain, attainment is to have a sense of fulfillment, but it's so 
vague and it's so personal in terms of what that means to each an individual. And I've always been really kind of just, again, baffled by it. And I was at a Tony Robbins event and I remember he's on stage speaking to this very large crowd of people. And he goes, you want to know what the secret to fulfillment is? And I literally like dropped my pen. I was like, holy shit, is he going to, is he going to tell us? Is he going to tell us like is this happening? Are we going to, is he going to tell us right now? And he goes, it's growth. That's it. The secret to fulfillment is growth. You're either growing or you're dying. You have to have a sense that every day you're becoming a better person. You're learning more. I saw a great quote the other day that said, um, oh God, what did it say? I think it said, uh, if you're not embarrassed by the person you were a year ago, you're not learning enough. Mm. And I just thought, Fuck, that's so powerful. Wow. Um, you know, another great quote, and I'm big on quotes, I'm big on inspiration, um, is hell on earth would be to meet the person you could have been. Wow. And, you know, those are the kind of things that I, I yeah. focus on. I just focus on just trying to grow each day, learn a little bit more. You know, you don't have to make these radical shifts in your life. You don't have to become 60% better tomorrow than you are today. You need to become fractionally better, 1% better, half percent better, quarter percent better, 1% better. And that compound effect will start to pay such massive dividends as it did in my career where I went from selling 50 million to 100 million to 200 plus million to 750 to 1.4 billion. Like all of a sudden, it's like if you look at, if everyone's ever studied the laws of compounding and you look at what it is to a savings account, right? That like you, you reach a certain critical mass and boom, it takes off like a rocket ship. So um, I don't know. That's what's next for me. Yeah. And to try to keep my eye on the, you know, on the opportunities that cross my path and hopefully have the guts to be able to capitalize on them. Absolutely. And going back to that concept of compounding, if you look at even 1% better a day, right? That's over 3,700% in a year. When you look at compounding, some people will be like, oh, you know, but it's literally that fractional fulfillment of, of, of chasing success on that, on that macro is, is way more significant than looking and saying, Hey, I need the, you know, you're not going to get to hundred million overnight. And you, what I just love about your story, what really like this, this probably has excited me more than a, a lot of other interviews I've done more so because you went into situations that a lot of Gen Z's we feel today, like entering a job you don't like after feeling like you were super cool and had everything. And then not only having a job you don't like, but coming in, crushing that job and being one of the top and then having that stripped away from you going through 2008, which is, I just had on Ross Gerber, who's one of the uh, billionaire financial advisors in Santa Monica. And he said, this is nothing compared to what he saw in 08. You know, this was, and you said the same thing, which is like, hey, yeah. oh, eight, people were committing suicide. There was all this going on. Now we're going through some rate hikes and inflationary period. And, you know, this is yeah. for you, you probably, this is nothing compared to that. No. And by the way, I work with Gerber Kawasaki. Sandra, oh, wow. They're fantastic. Oh, yeah. I love them. Yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah, great yeah, people. Small world. Awesome. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. Um, wow. No, you're absolutely right. And again, that comes with perspective and perspective just takes time. It takes experience. Yeah. I don't know. Thank you, by the way, for the compliment. Oh, I appreciate no, you saying that. Um, but I don't know how else I can say that. That really is what it comes down to. Um, you know, for me, the top of every, you know, at the top of every summit is the bottom of the next one. Yeah. So there is no peak. There is no like, because if you feel like you've reached the peak, how gratifying and rewarding that must be for a moment. And then how depressing the next, where do you go from there? What do you do? And that's why there's so many miserable billionaires out there. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds ridiculous when, you know, you're scraping pennies together, but like there's a bunch of really miserable rich people out there because they don't know what to do. They've amassed a, a bunch of wealth, but didn't bring them any happiness because they're not growing. They're not feeling fulfilled. So again, I really try to embrace that, you know, things again, I, I find these sort of like, you know, boiled down to the basic kind of quotes that really kind of drive yeah. me. And, you know, one of them is just like, you know, at every, at every level, there's another devil. Yeah. Yeah, right? and, like you just have to, you know, like I said, at the top of each summit is the bottom of the next yeah. and that everything's going to be hard, yeah. right? Anything you want to do that's going to be meaningful, that's going to really make a difference, make an impact, it's going to be hard. So choose your heart, yeah. find your heart and fucking go at it like a bat out of hell. I, I, I freaking love that. And look, I think I usually ask what's what's your 60 second commencement speech to the these Gen Z's if they're graduating college today. But honestly, you've been giving commencement speech after commencement speech with these gems that you're dropping. So, you know, the, the, the other question I'll ask you towards the conclusion instead is if I were to strip away everything from you now, right? Like you don't have this billion dollar empire anymore. You haven't sold, like you lose all your clients, your prospects, you know, what would you, what would your task be? What would you do on day one to rebuild what you have now? The first thing that I would do is not focus on the business, but focus on myself. Mm. 
I would try to find to carve out that space for myself to meditate, to get centered, to start with a gratitude exercise, right? I've just lost everything. Have I lost my breath? No, I can still breathe. Okay. Is my body filled with disease right now? No. Okay. I have my health. Um, do I have a family that still loves me? God willing, I hope so. Um, I would try to find gratitude in, you know, you have to remind yourself that there is someone somewhere right now on their knees begging for the things that we take for granted. Mm. And you have to kind of start from there each day. So that's how I would start in on what sounds like a really horrible morning, trying to wake up and recover from <laughs> having lost everything. Um, and then I would look at, you know, my affirmations, my incantations, trying to put myself in a mental place where I could actually go out and do the things I want need to do and be, be the person I need to be and then create a blueprint, create an outline. Don't shoot from the hip, right? So many people, especially in this industry, they wake up each day and they're like, well, let me see what I'm going to do. It's like, yeah. what? That's not a business plan. Yeah. So, you know, be intentional about what you do. Um, and that's probably how I would start. Yeah. Yeah. Intention is huge. I, the, the fact that you came back and grounded it to having your health, because without your health, you don't have anything. One thing I always give a lot of my audience members in the emails is one of the uh, Steve Jobs letters when he was sort of on this deathbed idea with Steve Jobs. You and I both have his phones. We, you know, he's left the legacy. He's left one of the richest people ever. And, you know, yep. once he didn't have his health, there's, there's not much more you can, right? Like there's, what, what else can you, like, that's, that's everything. So that perspective is key. You've, you've been driving that as the whole thematic this whole time. It's everything. I look, I had shoulder surgery um, a few months ago and it's been a pretty brutal recovery. And I was talking to my mom, who's a therapist and a social worker. And she was saying that, you know, when she was practicing more and, and, and meeting with patients, the first question they asked them is what's your level of pain? What's your level of pain today? Because the pain will mask the way you see the rest of the world. If you're in pain, the world looks shitty. It looks depressing. It just, you know, when your health is suffering, everything suffers. It masks the way you view the world, the way you perceive the world, the way you mm -hmm. interact with it. So getting your place yourself to a place of being centered is number one. Uh, that's, been, that's been a big part of my personal growth. And guys, I, I was 37 before I really learned that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have an opportunity again to work with a lot of, you know, ages of my team that are in their early to mid twenties. I say, guys, what you can do with your life learning these lessons now you're 15 years ahead of where i was yeah 37 i, I, I thought i thought you were 25 now i'm 43 no way 43 get, get out of here man 43 I, I swear to God. okay what the hell how do you stay so young what's the secret you're doing real estate this industry is not easy <laughs> i have some clients that are plastic surgeons uh, <laughs> no, I'm, joking. I'm joking about that um i blessed with good genetics yeah. 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 I'll thank my parents for that. I was going to say, hopefully we don't, we don't, you know, get mad at Powell for giving you some stress this last year. So this is a guy, this is a stress for those of you listening that uh, work in real estate, you know, this is a unbelievably stressful business. It will chew you up and spit you out. If you let it, um, you really have to protect yourself against that. I met with a, a woman yesterday that wants to become an agent and beautiful woman inside and out great personality, seems just very happy. And I said to her, I said, look, you seem like a happy person living a charmed life. Why in the world would you want to do real yeah. estate? Do you have any <laughs> idea what you're signing up for? Do you have any sense of the grind, the hustle, yep. the rejection, the defeat, all the things you have to deal with every day? Um, but, you know, if that doesn't get you up in the morning, if you don't thrive off that, it's probably not the right fit for you. Sure. Just isn't. Yeah. And I don't say that as a, a negative. I'm just saying, like, find your lane. If that's not, if that doesn't, it motivate you and inspire you probably not the right fit yeah and you you went back into the industry after what you saw in 08 you still came back and you you, you love it every day so look i mean it, it... i do i really do I, I love you know there's a lot of aspects of what i love about the job i love the thrill of the hunt i love that the job may be a lot of things but the one thing it isn't is monotonous every day is going to look different your schedule is going to be different it's going to throw different things at you and different challenges you have to think on your feet you got to be a quick problem solver and mm -hmm. solution finder and all those things um but I love, again, I'll go back to how blessed I am to get to live and work in LA, the people I get to meet. Yeah. Um, if you work in tech, you surround yourself with people in tech. If you work in marketing, you surround yourself with people in marketing. I get to meet people from all different walks of life from all over the world. Right. Some of them, the most influential people in the world. Right. That's unreal. Yeah. That, I mean, 
I, I have a lot of pinch myself moments of like, eh, this is, it's wild. It's um, I'm, I'm super grateful. Yeah. And from John, from where you started to where you got to, it's, it's one of those stories of the American dream and, and building what you built. So I just hope if anything, you know, we had a masterclass on real estate and, and selling and network and, you know, building your, not only your personal self, but your mindset and, and that meditation is key. But I got to say the, the most powerful thing is doing it from scratch and being humble in the process. So I, I got to thank you for that. I know the audience is going to all ask me where they can find you. So give us where yeah. people can follow you on social media and where we can stay connected with you. Sure. Um, easiest places on Instagram. Uh, it's just John Grauman, spelled J-O-N-G-R-A-U-M-A-N. -A -A um, you can also uh, follow our group there, Bond Collective. It's bondcollective.re, also on Instagram. Um, those are probably the two best places to find us. And if someone wants an internship or wants a chance to eventually work with you, I'm putting you on the spot here. Is there any way they can email someone at your firm? What does it work for if you if you guys end up ever do hiring for interns or jobs or agents? Yes. Yes, I do. Can I look at my phone here real quick please, and pull it up? Please. Apologies. I don't have it memorized. Oh, no, that's totally fine. I just know I'm, I know the type of audience. They're going to get so many questions. What if I want to work for John? Okay. Uh, you can email recruitment at bondre.com. Recruitment at bondre.com. Okay. Recruitment at bond. Okay. We'll put all that in the descriptions. And then my last thing for you, John, because you mentioned some of the stuff you say to the 20-year-olds. I know we're going over here, but the, the you mentioned talking to 20 year olds and telling them about God, what they, what you wish, you know, now you could do with your time. And you've given us a lot of that now, but what's the number one piece of advice that if you went back and told 21 year old, John, no money, no real estate, no nothing. What's the best piece of advice you'd give them? Just one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So many things. <laughs> when you think back on like who you were at that time and how much you thought you knew, and then you get to this point in your life and you go, Oh my God, I just really didn't know anything. Did I? Yeah. Um, I'll give you a couple of tactical ones Please. Um, in the industry. One of them is to get organized. Organization is not a skill is not one of my strong suits. It's okay. not. Um, and I, it is my business. I hate to say my business has suffered because that sounds a little bit <laughs> insensitive. Um, but uh, my business could be that much bigger. I could be that much further along if I were better organized because this business gets to a certain point where you just can't manage. It's, it's a long-term game. So some of these relationships you're building for years before they eventually turn into clients and buy and sell something. But you have to have a system in place to be able to follow up with those people on a regular cadence so that you don't lose those relationships. So that's a huge one, getting organized, um, you know, developing good systems. The other, what I talked about earlier, you know, finding some great self-help books or seminars that you can go to, um, doing that sooner rather than later, um, and really focusing on your mindset, being intentional about the kind of person that you want to be, the kind of life you want to lead. Uh, and I guess the third thing I would say is don't go it alone. I didn't. I I don't want to work in a vacuum. I, I I like I feel like the best ideas come from constructive collaboration. I want to challenge these ideas. I want to scrutinize them. I want to put them under the microscope. And from that, I'm going to come up with the best solutions and the best options and hopefully then the best decisions. Um, so I'm blessed to have, you know, four amazing partners and my wife, who I've not given nearly enough credit on this call, who is the CEO of our company. So she has 70 people that work underneath her. Wow. Um, she is the, the mastermind. We all work for her. Um, and uh, find a great partner. There's, I, I guess the last thing I'd say, and guys, you can tell I can probably just ramble on and on all day, oh, but no. there is no greater decision that you will make in this life than the partner you select. Period, full stop. In business, but even more so in life. That person you're going to conquer each, you know, you're going to um, take on each day with, try to conquer each day with, all the things you want to do and achieve and places you want to go, you just can't do it alone. But the partner you select will define you and everything you do in life, you're either playing up or you're playing down, right? If you're a tennis player and you're playing against a buddy of yours that you can just mop the floor with, you're never going to get any better. But if you go on the court with Venus Williams and she kicks the, you know, kicks your ass all over the court for a few hours, you're going to raise your game because you're going to have to, it's a survival. It's a matter of survival. You develop survival skills, right? Like, you throw someone that, you know, isn't a good swimmer into the middle of the ocean, what's going to happen? They're going to develop their swimming skills pretty quickly. So um, that's what I would say. Yeah, I love that. I love how you divided that into four important categories. And, you know, if I took away the biggest thing I took away from my audience, guys, if, is the fact that 
you know, he did this with his wife and they did it together and it was a journey. And, you know, a lot of times people say, don't go into business with your significant other. There's, you know, you hear people talk about divorces and look at how you guys survived that and not only survived, but thrived. So, so John, thanks for being a success story and t- telling us there's hope to do that. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. I love doing this kind of stuff. Um, I think that when you achieve any level of success, and I really do mean any level, you can have just a success story from one moment to one instant. There's a responsibility that comes with that to share it and to pass it on so that someone else can glean something from it, can learn from something from it. And um, I, I love what you're doing, man. This is like, it's, it's such a great concept. Um, and I, I really think that you're making a difference. So thank you for having me and thank you for doing this. John, thank you so much for being part of that difference. That is John Grauman, who is part of the Netflix show Buying Beverly Hills. He's the go-to agent. He has a phenomenal real estate group. They just did over $1.4 in sales if you guys are just tuning in. Make sure to follow John. I'll put all his stuff in the description below. John, thanks for being on because at the end of the day, the more we know, the more we grow. Thanks, everybody.